At seven o'clock, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. okay, so I need to read a description. The laws governing boards of education require that our work be done where the public can observe their actions. Please remember that this is the board's meeting for the public to observe. Others may participate only with the approval of the board. So with that said, we have a visitor's guest list back on the back table, if everyone would sign that. And I'm looking for the approval of the minutes from the October 10th work session and October and regular board meeting and the October 17th special session. I move to approve the October 10th, 2022 work session minutes and regular board meeting minutes and the October 17th, 2022 special session minutes. And I second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the October 10th work session minutes and regular board meeting minutes and October 17th special session minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Um, Prioritize agenda, Mr. Drill. Good evening. So we have a couple of groups that are here to visit with us and talk with us about some things. And so we're going to put those folks first uh, this evening. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have our friends and colleagues from Chemeketa Community College. And then we have our um, esteemed group from FFA to give us an update about how their trip went. So uh, let's go down that way and then okay. on with uh, our reports. Okay. So the Chebecca Community College folks. Okay, well, uh, board members and superintendents, it's our great pleasure to be here. I'm Jessica Howard, the president of Chebecca Community College, and I'm joined here by Ken Hector, who is on our board of education and represents the cell. Turn over to you, Ken. Thank you, Jessica. And again, nice to meet all of you, um, members of the board, Superintendent Drill. Nice to see some familiar faces again. It's been a while. Um, anyway, we're here to express our appreciation for the wonderful working relationship we have with Cascade School District. You know, we're we're all in the same business, and that's student success. And, and to be able to partner with you along that pathway, it's it's pretty rewarding and meaningful. So thank you for all you do to facilitate that, that program. Just like to share a few things with you and students and as well as faculty and, and parents might be in the audience. Um, last year, 94 Cascade High students paid $30 to participate in Schmeckett's College Credit Now program. They are in 554 Schmeckett College credits, saving their families $69,200. 35% of Cascade High graduates from 2021 enrolled at Schmeckada. 218 graduates with a 3.5 or better grade point average enrolled as Schmeckada scholars, uh, meaning they were awarded full tuition scholarship. Schmeckada scholars from Cascade High have accumulated total tuition savings of 1.1 uh, million. Um, over the course of the, the program. Pretty significant savings. I know some of you in the room, I think, have had kids who have been able to take advantage of that program. Um, 182 uh, graduates who received the Oregon Promise enrolled at Chemeca in the last five years. Those recipients uh, who came to Chemeca have been awarded a total of $473,000 to date through that program. In the past five years, uh, 309 Schmeckada High alumni have completed either a Schmeckada certificate or degree and or transferred from Schmeckada to a four-year institution. Again, thank you for being an excellent partner with Schmeckada and, and our mutual endeavors to ensure student success. We're happy to take any questions, although I expect <laughs> most of them to President Howard, because she gets the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Question. So kids that participate in the program all need to have 3.5, or do you take students that have a lesser GPA? We take all, we take the top 100% of applicants. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, that get tuition help, I guess. The tuition, um, 
scholarship is for Chemeketa scholars, so that's 3.5 and above. Okay. Uh, I would also, however, um, let everyone know, and you probably know this already, but um, right now everyone qualifies for Oregon Promise, and that should cover all tuition and fees. And if you're a Chemeketa scholar, you get that plus the full tuition uh, amount. So you actually end up not only paying for all of your expenses, but you end up with additional money in your pocket to help you uh, make it through the, the year. It's really quite something. That is something. I have a question. What GPA do they have to maintain to go into the second year? To keep I think it's the same. Yeah. yeah, and actually, now that you mentioned that, I have to qualify my earlier statement. You need a 2.0 or above to get Oregon Promise. Okay. Uh, so there is a floor there, but no expected family contribution component this year. Those things change, have changed over the since the last year <coughs> Oregon Promise. Right now, it is uh, something that's available to everyone, anyone with a 2.0 or above, and that's the same requirement going forward, like the scholars. So I will tell you, my, my daughter went through the program and I have a son that's currently in the program at Schmeckata right now and, and taking advantage of those programs as well. So thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. So great. Yeah. And Kelly comes from good stuff. That's right. Hey, I was a junior college guy, Shasta Knights in Reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rasmussen. Yeah, and as uh, Steve Rasmussen, the current principal of the high school, we just want to thank you for your partnership. privileged to be doing this with you all and I think you know we're as uh, strong as we are connected so mm -hmm. thanks so much for helping us and for um, you know treating our students as the same group that we're trying to help progress that we all know is so important in today's world so thank you so for every student and parent in this room which we have a few today um, keep that in the back of your brain that your 3.5 will get you Full ride 2.0 gets you lots of help, and you can get there. Chemeket is what eight miles away, twelve miles away. It's about twelve, yeah. 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 So um, it's it's a good option for some people. So because you earn the classes here, right? We have how many we have classes here? Yeah. How many do we have? Classes we are adding all the time. We just had a production class. Nice. Okay, great. Is, is there more you'd like to see from us? Is there more that, that we can do to be partners, better partners for you folks? I would just say, keep sending us the, these well-prepared students that you are sending us. That, you know, uh, it's clear from the number of scholarship recipients that you're sending us. And, and, you, and you know, not everyone is a 3.5, but uh, other kids that you that, uh, are a little below that are coming and they're doing well. Mm -hmm. And so it, I think that speaks volumes about the Cascade School District system. And uh, we're, we're happy, we're, we're honored to have your kids, whether you're a parent or staff and faculty, we're honored to have your kids. And you know, our, our mission, of course, is to not let you down and to do everything we can to support those kids. Excellent. I do have one bit of news that you might find interesting. And that is that a year from now, next fall, it's a little less than a year from now, we'll be offering our, our first applied bachelor's degree. This is a bachelor's degree for those who get a two-year career and technical education degree from us, or really from, from any two-year institution. So traditionally, the split has been you know, sharp left to go into transfer courses. That means you either go directly to the university where you come to us and then transfer to the university or sharp right and you go into career technical education, two years stop, go out into the workforce. This stacks on top of that degree and gets you a bachelor's degree. So the old paradigm of one way gets you a bachelor's degree and one way doesn't is no longer applicable. And in fact, Western is being an amazingly good partner with us. So if you get that applied bachelor's degree from us, which is a bachelor's degree, right? It's just got the word applied on it, so we're able to offer it. Um, you have one term's credit towards the organizational leadership master's program at Western. So this is what it means to be part of an educational ecosystem that works together for the benefit of students, regardless of what their choices 
are in terms of major. It's really groundbreaking. And I think we're going to have to talk about it a lot for people to really believe it because it's really quite different from, I think, the way a lot of us have grown up. And so it's pretty exciting stuff. And that means that you can go into machining or automotive or medical assisting or welding or law enforcement or fire protection. And you can go right out into the workforce and immediately start working on that bachelor's degree without stopping working at all. Mm -hmm. oh, I have a question. On that. So, but that's going to be longer than two years, though. No, it's not. Does that apply to nursing also? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hopefully. Really? <laughs> I got to be careful how I phrase this. Let's just say there's a, there is at least one large entity that isn't real supportive of that idea. And uh, there are a number of community colleges that are in favor of that. We're working hard at the legislature because it takes the legislative change. So um, we're going to persist because, you know, the medical world really wants uh, bachelor's degree with their nurses. Right. And, uh, and so if we can make it easier for students to get there while they're working, instead of having to step aside and incur debt, instead of stepping aside into the workplace and making real good money. So that's what we're, we're hoping to overcome that. That one little, that one little well, not so little, but a, a legislative hiccup. That, uh, okay. So stay tuned on that one. Yeah. Well, but, and it's an interesting <coughs> question because the average nursing um, pass rate in terms of the national exam in the state is around 85% and we're at 100%. So we have the highest nursing pass rate in the state. Just a really, really competitive nursing program. So to be able to get nurses from the RN to the BSN mm -hmm. is, um, I think, something that this is our one of our big priorities this year but that means that it's right here right yeah. here at your doorstep the opportunity to get the degree and the majority of community college students stay in the community right. and that's something many communities are really invested in right and i happen to know a lot about that program but i know that the students they do they take a lot of hours before they ever get in that two-year program anyway so when it's all said and done they probably have the same hours as a bachelor at a university. So lots of, yeah, that's wonderful. Great. Anything else? Cool. You know, we got a lot of it's okay. Questions. Real quickly, I want to thank you both. Uh, Dr. Howard, appreciate the, the, the connection. Um, having, getting a chance to sit in meetings with other superintendents in our region. Uh, it is universally, I just want to let people know, it is universally known that um, you are a person that has helped the leadership role at Chemeketa and allowed for all of us to work together, just like you just talked about. It's not always been the case, but we appreciate that. And uh, that's a big deal. And Ken, it's just great to see you. I don't know if people know, but uh, this man here has been in public service and dealing with public stuff for years. So if, if he looks like the mayor of Silverton, he was the mayor of Silverton for a long time. <laughs> So he's been around our community and been a part of just helping community and people. And I just want to say thank you guys. Appreciate thank it you for taking the time to come out. Thank you so much. Thanks. 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 Appreciate, Appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. FFA presentation. No. Okay. Everybody to see. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so first of all, thank you. Uh, we had a fantastic trip. We went across three different states um, and saw quite a bit of um, things we just hadn't seen, you know, uh, some fun uh, opportunities. Here's eight of the members that went with us. Um, a couple had some conflicts. Apparently there's an end of soccer thing going on tonight. So uh, they were unable to, uh, unable to make it tonight, um, but they, they wanted to share a uh, couple things. One was that the Nashville Zoo is better than the Oregon Zoo. Oh. And I would have to concur. It is a pretty amazing zoo. That was zoo number seven for me. And um, it just, it was special. And two, um, they, they enjoyed the keynote speakers. We had a couple opportunities to listen to some keynote speakers. Um, one was a uh, Tamika, I forget her last name right now. She's a WNBA player. Um, and she, she shared a, a message with uh, the members we, uh, in session number one. Um, that was a Lucas Oil Stadium, and uh, so as a Colts fan, I might have been geeking out a little bit, but um, <laughs> just, just a little, 
That was kind of special. Um, I eventually let them have a picture next to the Peyton Manning statue when I was done with it. Um, but uh, there was about, at that meeting, we had about 35,000 FFA members present for that very first session. There was 65,000 registered for the event, which is a pretty good portion of the 850,000 FFA members that are there nationwide. Um, so it was pretty cool to be able to bring eight um, from uh, you know the Cascade, Oregon chapter, in which we ran into a Cascade, Idaho chapter while we were there, took a photo photo op, and so um, all in all, it was uh, from an advisor point of view, it was a fantastic trip. Uh, took eight wonderful students with us, and I've asked them each to kind of share a little bit of you know the highlights from the trip, so you can hear straight from them, and we'll start with Hannah. Yeah, so my name is Hannah Kramer. I am the current secretary of Cascade FFA. Um, my favorite part, there was a zoo, which was pretty nice. Fun fact, there's monkeys in the bathroom. Um, it's kind of okay. weird, not going to lie, but it was fun. Uh, but my favorite part was probably the, um, this farm that we went to with all the dairy cattle and the, uh, hog set up. Uh, what was it called? Pharaoh's farm. Pharaoh's. I, was, I want to say circle. I don't know why. <laughs> Pharaoh's farms. They had like. 57,000 dairy cattle there. Wow. 37, sorry. I'm off of food last <laughs> I was close. And it had a lot of pigs there too. It was pretty cool to see their whole setup. Um, it was very interesting to say the least. They had like, I don't know, I'm a dairy cow person. They had like three different kinds of milking systems set up. They had a carousel. Um, they had a robot in walk-in milker and there's I don't remember all of them, but there was, they were super cool. So. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Warner. I am the uh, technical, I was the secretary, but okay. Um, I had a lot of fun there. Um, definitely one was the bonding time with everybody, um, just getting to know everybody a little bit more and then just having a lot of fun because there's definitely some moments that we had a lot of fun. Um, and then um, the second was one of the key, or not keynote speakers, but um, the retiring address um, of one of the national officers so that's actually from Oregon. Um, and one of the things that he said that I actually really look up to is just how he said to be bold, but basically just don't be afraid to try anything that you don't want to do because um, you never know like what you'll get from that experience. Um, I'm Grace Johnson, and I am a new transfer student this year, so um, a big component was the FFA, and so to have this opportunity was really special to me. Um, one of the highlights was being able to go to the keynote speakers. I really um, liked um, the inspiration and the stuff that they shared, um, and also they had a college there, like a college kind of touring all the agriculture colleges there. Um, and talking to the people there and I got a lot of stuff out of that and kind of helped me realize how many things we can do in agriculture. Um, and so that kind of helped me figure out kind of where I kind of want to go for my future. Um, um, my name is Megan Eckes. Um, I really enjoyed mostly being able to hang out with mostly all my friends during this FFA trip and getting to experience something I've never been able to before and tra traveling with all of my friends. And it was definitely a nice to be able to go because I like going to our Pharaoh's farm that we did and learning about dairy cows, dairy cow stuff, which I don't really know much about and getting to see all the pigs there because I'm a pig show and I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm Sophia Gerdich, I'm a chapter reporter. Uh, Overall, I had a great time. I learned a lot. Um, I got to meet some great people from Arkansas and Texas. Um, they had some great people. And then I really, really enjoyed the college fair aspect because I'm a senior and I didn't know like for sure what I was going to do and I didn't know what college I wanted to go to. So it was really cool. I got to see uh, a few colleges and meet with their members and I got to make some friends and that was super cool. Any questions for FFA members? Did you or guys drive myself? or did you fly? Uh, we flew. <laughs> you flew? Yep. Okay. We flew from uh, PDX into uh, Nashville. We spent an, uh, a day there. And then we um, timed it perfect. As soon as we walked out of the zoo, it started raining. And it rained the entire drive up to Indianapolis. And then it stopped. 
and we had pretty good weather, weather the rest of the time. So then we spent the rest of the time in Indy. Um, then we flew out of Indianapolis back to PDX. Did they have entertainment for you guys at all? Um, like um, bands like or singers yeah. or concerts well, or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, the, the FFA mm -hmm. band was celebrating its 75th year. Okay. Um, you know, I know Cascade. My kids have been part of that in the past. And so um, they're they're still doing uh, doing well with that. And that's a neat they. They're at every session. They, they, they're playing in the hallways of the convention hall. Um, and so we did get to see that. The choir performed for us. That has national choir. They wow. were there on stage. Um, we heard a couple couple things from, um, from them. And then um, the rest was was kind of, you know, we, we spent through, we were there three times, like actually at the convention, spending hours in that expo hall. Just, uh, you know, I went with... Um, I think my check-in luggage was like 35 pounds when I went. It was 42 coming back. And that was just, you know, the, the people that we obviously want me by curriculum or wanted to give me a free poster and all, all that stuff. And I know Ms. Walisa and I were just grabbing everything from every school we possibly could and talking to them. And, um, you know, it was, there's a lot to engage with there for sure. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Was, was this a competition event or just a, this was an experience. Okay. Um, we hope to go uh, about it every other year would be, would be right for us because this is an expensive trip for these kids to go to. Mm -hmm. um, our FFA alumni did kick in a little bit and help cover their uh, the registration costs. The registration for the event was about $90 a kid. So it's an expensive, expensive deal. Um, so for the experience, I would prefer to take kids every other year so they have a couple opportunities to go. Um, and then if we were to win a state event, then we'd qualify and be able to Ah. be able to go and so last year we did not accomplish that we've got a few things we're working on for this year so fingers crossed we'll see how it goes mm -hmm. i'm so glad you got to go it's such yeah. a great experience at your age and to, to glean even to come home with two or three things but it sounds like you just came home with a brain full of overflowing of what are we going to do different cows different pigs different colleges which is huge so i'm very excited you got to go thank you for proving Letting us go. Absolutely. Let's go I can't wait. I'd, I'd do it again next year, but we'll wait for two years, I guess. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if they win something in the state, in the state yeah. then you're in. That's See right. Yeah. Okay. We're Justin, done. is this the first time we've been in a while? What, what's our, our history on this? Um, I do believe that Cascade has not. I think the last time Cascade went would have been about 2018. Yeah. Okay. So it's been about four years. I think years. Terrace Junior year was the last ah, time. Okay. That um, that that we went, and so it it been a, it been a minute. Um, so we're thankful that we took one, two, three. We took four seniors. Four seniors. Yeah. Okay. So we we got we got them in. Good. Got them to go. Um, and then we took a uh, one freshman. Right. Nice. Everybody else is in, in the middle there. So. Great. Yeah, mind. Yep. So four seniors right here. No, we got Nicole and Sophie. And oh, I guess we only have three. Oh, we have three. And Haley, I guess, is our third. And then Grace is our junior. Great, yeah, Grace is our junior. So we took three seniors. Okay. So, okay. Yep. Nice. yep. Great. Excellent. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you for going with them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you didn't get to it. Well, support it. Thank you. Now, Tony went with us, and she thought she was a She Okay. Moving on to report, superintendent's report, Mr. Drill. Good evening. I'm glad we got to hear from a couple of people. It's starting to feel more and more normal every time we have a board meeting. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, after completing uh, nine, we're into the 10th week of school. I can't believe we're saying that already. Um, I wanted to get back with you guys on the enrollment. We continue to grow. Um, and at the same time, we're continuing to grow. We have continued to shrink uh, the amount of inter-district transfers. So we're, we're, that's the, at the lowest amount we've had in over a decade on the inter-district transfers. We have a wait list for every building in our district, uh, save the Opportunity Center. Um, but Every other building has a wait list of kids that want to get in here. We put a hold on that to see where our numbers are. We are uh, officially uh, right around 115 students up for sure, but there are moments when that number seems to climb even a little higher. So we are rolling in the student numbers. We are <clears throat> on here. I think I put down 
2,685 students, which is the highest, but I think as of Thursday, we were at 2,993. Um, I keep waiting for the number to go down, but it goes up. That means people are moving in to the district, and if they move in, then they're able, able to go. So I, I gave you that information uh, there in my report. Um, we finished up the four modular classrooms at Cloverdale, got everybody moved in. Uh, Mr. Dyer looks normal again, uh, back to the regular stuff. Uh, so that was a good thing. I'd like to thank him, his staff, all the volunteers, uh, some students from the high school that helped, uh, you know, just, just like normal, right? Uh, Mr. Rise is here tonight and he uh, uh, worked some of his magic and helped with, I think it's the baseball team, yeah? Uh, so the baseball team showed up and helped out uh, to get uh, all of our desks and chairs moved in. And everything uh, went uh, swimmingly perfect. So uh, kids are in, they're down to just one or two very minor things to get taken care of and, and all will be well there. Uh, our goal now is the seismic grant in the high school. Mr. Pillar has already spent time at Upward Energy to see if we can get that grant uh, to move forward. And uh, the conversation uh, is ongoing with Mr. Rasmus in the science department and the ability for us to add uh, uh, four science classrooms here outside the science wing out there in the grass uh, for the start of the next school year. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, the last thing I mentioned is that you probably have heard uh, across the media about uh, some of the student scores across the nation, across the state, how they've gone down. Uh, we did have some scores go down. Uh, Mr. Thatcher has some of that information. He can talk about it. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that um, we did go up, actually, in, in reading. Um, that's interesting when that's not something that most districts did in that process in the middle of a worldwide pandemic and very hampered by the ability to teach kids like we normally do. So we're excited about getting back to school. Uh, we're not going to spend time dealing with the autopsy of how that might have gotten better or, or anything else. We're focused on moving forward. So that's the plan. Questions? I don't have any questions. No. Anybody no. else? Hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Next report, Cascade Opportunity Center's report, Ms. Thompson and students. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're right. No, you're I sorry. thought so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Nice to see everyone. Um, I sent you my report. You have it in front of me. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer what you have. I have a couple. So it sounds like you're doing amazing things with the garden, with the fitness trail, with archery. Um, how is that all going to be open to the rest of the district? Not the garden so much, because I know that's projects for the kids, but like the fitness trail, maybe not either, but the archery, you talk about having that be a hub for the district. How are we going to work that? Do we know that yet? That is a really great question, because that was going to be my one thing that I was going to say. Um, oh, perfect. So yes, it's going to be the hub for the district. Okay. And um, I'm happy to say that one of the coaches works at my school now, um, Mr. Aaron McEwen, who's here tonight. So oh. if I can't answer all the questions, he might be able to answer that. Okay. But from what I understand, um, they're working out transportation. Mr. Medlock is the other archery coach. And so he has just recently obtained his um, license to be able to drive a minibus. And so the plan is to have some students who are at the high school ride over with him and participate in that club after school. Um, currently, okay. they practice above the gym where wrestling usually takes place, the practice for that. And so I think wrestling starts in December. And so once that happens, Today. archery has to move out. Starts so, tonight. Okay, okay Today. there you go. Yeah. So um, I just want to just say a big thank you to Mr. Medlock, Mr. McEwen, Tony Walisa, and a number of students and parents and some teachers that came out just yesterday and did some renovation um, in the gym that's behind the main building at the Opportunity Center. And it was a pretty big feat. There was some, uh, there's about one third of it was walled off with two by fours and plywood to make space for storage. And so we got the approval to get rid of some of the stuff that has been there for 20 years. <laughs> we found homes for some of the other things, but um, that building really, there hasn't been a lot done with it. I think um, for a while it was used with batting cages for the baseball team, but it has just been basically unused. So 
I'm really excited at the fact that we get to be a part of what's going on as a district and at the secondary level to be able to um, provide a sport right now, a club that is one of the top 10 fastest growing sports in the nation. And it's a very inclusive sport. Um, so I'm happy to be able to offer that to students and a number of our students that attend our school who have transportation issues that can't always go to the high school after school to mm -hmm. participate, they're able to do this. And so I'm just really excited to see how that will grow, you know, coming up now that we have a nice facility and it's getting nicer. So there's still some work to be done there. Um, but we did a whole bunch of stuff yesterday and um, very happy with the results of that. How many students do you have room for in the program? Mr. McHugh can answer that one. As many as the little kids. Oh, okay, and it's all high school level kids? Right now it's just high school. Just high school. Well, that's that's a big bunch. So okay. I think Lindsay's been part of that too. And it's one of those things where you have to have an indoor facility to control the wind and right. all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a competition in March, is that right? Yes. So it's a Saturday or so. Mm -hmm. so okay. Getting ready for that. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. That is exciting. I'm excited. You, you're doing a lot of stuff out there. That's great. It's a big team effort for sure. And we're hoping to get that field in the back even nicer because last year Little League used it and it was just a difficult field to play on. But we're conditioning it and working on it and looking forward to that field being used more at the community level. So um, it's just nice to get people out there. Right, mm -hmm. it is. And you're welcome to come out and check it out. The field is, the trail is beautiful. I love walking it and students love it and it's just gonna get better. Great, thank you so much. Anybody have other questions? Nope. I do, I do wanna ask one question. What is, what's our goal long-term with the uh, virtual academy? The goal? Yeah. Well, are we I wanting to grow it? Are we wanting to be like, hey, we're statewide? Are we wanting to keep it somewhat, <laughs> you know? Well, I don't know. I think it has a lot of potential because uh, if anything, COVID has shown that sometimes traditional education right. is not a good fit for people. So it's just really, really nice to be able to provide an option for students and still be part of the Cascade School District. There's other um, schools out there that are virtual academies. Right. Um, it's just nice that our district is able to provide that. And I still have lots of students that want to enroll. And we're still coming from a pandemic that really impacted students and their um, social anxiety, um, just social skills in general. And, you know, we try to work with them to try to build that capacity back up. But it's just really nice that they can kind of park and kind of get that stuff together and still maintain obtaining their credits so that they don't fall behind in their classes. So I think as far as a goal, I think is to continue to provide that option for students that need it. And the numbers right now are kind of back down to the pre-pandemic right. numbers. <clears throat> it's been around 25, 30 students with a handful of junior high students. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty nice level okay. for the staffing that we have. Right. Um, so, I mean, as it stands right now, it's just really nice to have that option. So if it simply just kept the numbers going forward for the next year, two or five or 10, we'd be good with that? I think so. Okay. I mean, it'd be great if it grew. It just means more for, for our district. Right. Um, I get calls from people that are out of district wanting to see if that's an option for their students as well. So I answer lots of questions about that. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, I have before, and I don't want to take up too much time because I didn't want to talk this much. Oh, please. I have a couple students here that I invited to come and just kind of share their experience. I think us at the Opportunity Center, we're kind of that quiet place that, you know, we do our thing. And I just want to highlight some of the effort and some of the stories that we have from a couple students. And I just want to thank them ahead of time to, because of their brave bravery and coming and speaking in front of people. So I know that's a big challenge. So please um, welcome them. Absolutely. All right, who's going first? Oh, really? Come on, flip a coin. Yeah, rock, <laughs> rock, paper, scissors. Is that what you're going to do? 
Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> we don't bite, honest. Welcome. Hello, I'm Lindsay Thompson. I'm a senior over at the Opportunity Center. And when COVID happened, going online at the high school, they the teachers were new. They didn't always know what they were going. But they weren't always helpful when I was trying to figure out because I wasn't sure what I was doing either. Um, and my grades were suffering. But when I got switched over to the Opportunity Center, um, the teachers were always like messaging, like, hey, what you seem a little behind. How can I help you catch up? What can we do? Um, because I was online. And I finally came in person this year because after my knee surgeries, it's like I didn't really want to do the stairs really. And the staff is so nice. I was like, being in person might be okay after two years of not being in school. So it was a little scary, but I've also been really worried about not being able to graduate. I was behind and being at the Opportunity Center, I got caught up again and I feel like I should be graduating on you on time. Um, and our counselor, Ms. Kinkle, has been helping me get ready for college, help me get my FAFSA and apply for college. And she helped me prepare for a job interview. Um, and with that, it helped me prepare for any type of interviews I do. So for our um, senior exit interview, I feel more ready for that. She gave me a bunch of tips on how to be ready and how to professionally do an interview. And she's been doing, um, well, like meetings for seniors to help them figure out what the plans were after college. And she's been helping us find um, scholarships and something with college. I've always been worried I can't go because I can't afford it. And her find, helping us find um, scholarships has helped me not be a little less worried about that. And I am the only one in my family who will be graduating high school and will be the only one to graduate um, college. Good for you. <laughs> and both being my family and Cascade Opportunity Center have been very supportive and have done everything they can do to make my dreams real. And I appreciate all they do for me and all that they will get to do for others. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Congratulations, you. Lindsay. That's awesome. So I got a question for you before you sit down. Right. What are you wanting to study when you go on to college? I want to become a vet. I want to open up my own place to do wildlife rescue and rehab. Nice. nice. Good job. And good luck in that. Yes. You'll make it. Thank, Thank you. you. So, hi, I'm Sage Roche. Um, I graduated here at the Opportunity Center last year. I'm a single mom. I have a little eight-month-old baby. Um, I'm going through pre-nursing pre and doing the CNA program at Lynn Benton Community College. I have 12 credits going for this term and next term. Um, the Opportunity Center really helped me get grounded because I went here for my sophomore and my junior year, and then I stopped school once COVID happened. Um, I got pregnant, and when I came back, I think it was really hard, but getting back into school and having the support that I never had growing up really helped me like be able to learn what I wanted to do. And I have a two year full ride to do all the premier staying and the most support ever from the school district. So I'm sorry that was really short. That's Congratulations. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it scares so everyone. Good. It's okay. <laughs> You're doing so well. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you guys for coming. Any questions from anyone? Just congratulations to both of you and to all of you that are doing the good work. You guys can sneak out if you want to. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. stay. But thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming in. Okay.
Assistant Superintendent's Report, Mrs. Moorfield. This is the first report that I have given to you guys as um, just as an assistant superintendent, I used to do all the curriculum pieces. Um, so I wanted to just take the opportunity to share with you um, some of the information that I have learned um, in being able to go to the various conferences that um, I attend. Um, two big ones in October were our local Oregon School Personnel Association conference. Um, that's where I received all of my Title IX coordinator training, two days of Title IX. It's pretty intense, um, eight in the morning to five o'clock at night. Um, and then the National um, American Association of School Personnel Administrators um, happened in Orlando just a couple of days later um, and was able to spend uh, several days there uh, gathering and, and learning a whole bunch of information. Um, shared with you some of the um, nuggets of information that I brought back that I just thought were, were really good things to share. Um, 81,000 hours of our lives are spent at work. That's crazy. I know. Um, and in thinking about that, um, <clears throat> if you're in the people business, like we are, you really need to have a heart for people. You're spending that many hours of your life with people. You need to have a heart for people. Um, we also need to find the right people for Cascade. I thought this was a really interesting quote that as a school district, we aren't just recruiting employees. Um, we are sowing the seeds of our reputation. So finding the right people um, is extremely important. Um, and in finding the right people, it's important for us to start thinking about how we are going to invest our time, um, money, and energy into our staff. Um, and then the last one was make the welcome to the district a memorable one. One of the uh, sessions that I went to talked about um, how to make that onboarding process. We're, we're introducing our new employees at the beginning of the school year, how to make that very memorable and exciting for our new employees. So whenever they do start their job here, that's one of the things that they're like, wow, you know, whenever I came, they really made me feel like a member of the team, a member of the family. Um, so those are, uh, that's something that I want to incorporate uh, with our onboarding process. Um, also talked about um, being in the buildings um, once a month um, in each building. We'll see how that goes. Um, I'm generally not the person that people want to see whenever I walk into a building um, because it usually means somebody's in trouble. And I want to change that perspective. Um, and I want people to feel like, I'm a trust individual and um, that they can come talk to me and that I'm not always there because somebody's in trouble. So Don, can I ask a question? Yes. How, how do you do that at a building? How do you make that yourself available or let the people know you're there to assist, not to have them under the microscope? Right. You know, I mean, do you go sit in, in, you know, I'll say Pete, cause he's sitting right there in Pete's office and just wait for someone to knock on the door. Do you go walk the halls? What's, what's um, the game plan? My, my plan is to, of course, let people know that, Hey, I want to let you know that I'm going to be in your building. Here's why I'm going to be in your building. Um, want to be there as a support, want to be there to answer questions. If you want to just come by and say hi, um, you know, just for chit chat, that's great too. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping I lost my train of thought hoping that the more that I'm in the building and people feel like, hey, you know, she's not here just because somebody's in trouble, that it will help build and improve that rapport with staff. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and then the second part of my report, uh, because I was at conferences in October, I did not have the opportunity to share my goals uh, with the board in October when all of the other administrators did. So I wanted to provide those goals to you. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I did want to ask if you had any questions. No, I, I like question, but it's not the, about the goals. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> when you get trained in, in Title IX, is your role at that point then to come back to the district and do some training with the Title IX instructors? So every year, Title IX coordinators have to go through compliance training. I'm also um, certified to do the training um, so that I do come back 
and train our administrators um, in their annual compliance training by the mine. And I did that at our administrators retreat at the beginning of August. Um, I do have some additional roles uh, that I have to train people for, investigator roles, decision maker roles, um, appeals person role, um, and we'll be going through that training as well. Okay. Any other questions? I think your goals are really good. So I'm gonna, I'll take them home and slice and dice them and put them with the rest of the goals and see where we're at. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. having them. Yeah. Thank and you thank much. you for um, allowing me the opportunity to go to the OSBM conference this weekend. Um, great information, um, heard some great keynote speakers, and most importantly, it was great to get to know you all better. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, back at you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Financial director's okay, report. Scott. Now, <laughs> Mr. Pillar. <laughs> Well, hearing from students it always trumps hearing about numbers. Yeah. Well, every day. you're right. I'd much rather, I'd much rather hear from students than from me. Um, in front of you, the financial report uh, shows that we're tracking very well. Uh, note that the uh, uh, enrollment increase that uh, Mr. Joel uh, speaks of has not impacted our finances yet. Uh, they will. We just did. Uh, we set up our adjustment uh, at the end of last month. And we should start seeing an increase in the amount of state school fund revenue parceled out for the remaining nine months of the, of the months that we get state school fund revenue. So that new enrollment probably comes into about $1.25 million for us, uh, more than we had expected. So that's a, that's a really good position for us to be in. Obviously, our expenses are tracking well and very close to budget. Um, You'll notice in the body of my written report, we I discuss a lot this month on uh, the, the crisis situation that we're seeing in auditing firms statewide. Um, most auditing firms um, are, are seeing a, a significant uh, problem getting people uh, licensed, municipal auditors getting to work, CPA, CPAs are not uh, able to attract staffing that well. Right. Uh, one of the largest auditing firms in the state has already reached out to ODE to talk about um, potentially getting in audits in late. Um, the, the direct re response to that from us in our case is that your copy of the 2021 audit, your certified copy, is uh, finally on your desk right now. We do not have anyone here to um, explain it from the auditors. Um, which is not surprising. It's unfortunate, but not surprising. Mm -hmm. I will say that this is my 17th audit. And so, um, and I've sat in a chair. So if you have any questions at all as to what you might want to be looking at, some of the questions you have to have laid out and whatnot, I'm, I'm certainly open to uh, addressing those in a public session or a telephone call or an email, whichever, whatever you have. So, uh, I realize that you didn't have that ahead of time. Um, I apologize for that, but we just got it probably two or three months ago. Scott, other than the timeliness, is there any concerns you have about the audit? Um, the, you mean in terms of the report that comes out? Yeah, I mean, if, just looking through it, is there anything that's red flag that we ought to be aware of? Or uh, No, I will say that I have, there were two findings. Okay. Um, the two findings that we received, one was, um, we, we do, did not have a system of having Mr. Grill checking my work on the bank reconciliations. Uh, we have about eight accounts that I reconcile every month. We've just never had him sign off on those. Right. Um, and uh, that is a practice we've put into practice now. The second finding we had was we do a lot of grant draws. And I was doing those grant draws mostly because we were pretty shorthanded and um, also did not get uh, a second set of eyes on those grant draws. We have fixed that with the hiring of, of Katie in our office. So she does the grant draws now and I review those grant draws. Okay. So there's two people always checking all those numbers. Right. But other than that, uh, no significant findings in terms of the financials. We have an unqualified opinion, which means that there's no, no particular issues out there. Um, I was a little bit, you know, I had some little challenges. We've had a little bit of go around in terms of getting materials back and forth, but I noticed that they did not have any management dis disagreements with us as to how to move forward with that. So. Okay. And as far as your opinion on these folks as auditors, 
you feel they do a good job? Are they good to work with? No? We're at a public session. So okay. <laughs> I can that answer. Fair enough. Uh, if you want to ask me a question about that <laughs> no, privately, I'd be happy to uh, share that. Understood. Thank you. Scott, do you think there, as a follow-up, do you think there's another company out there we could readily go to? So? No, there is not. I um I actually looked. Um, is that right? I've been yes, I've been looking quite a bit. Um <laughs> when we first went out for our you know, this is the first audit year that these folks worked for us. Right. Uh, when we went up for audit, we had three respondents. I talked to the other two respondents. Uh, they are unable to do it. Our prior firm, uh, Wilcox Arredondo, which we had right. a really good working relationship with, has gotten out of the muni audit business altogether. Right. So they are not doing any of that work any longer. So we're we're kind of we're a bit in in a pinch. Right. You're kind of stuck. Yeah. yeah. But it's but, like all school districts. It's not just us. Absolutely. In okay. fact, I've been on uh, two calls with ODE. I sat on a couple of uh, OASBO uh, state school fund uh, subcommittees, uh, which is a, when we're the smallest school district represented there. Um, on those subcommittees, it, it's been the topic of conversation for the last two weeks. Wow. Okay. So it's it's at the state level. The state uh, superintendent of education is well, or the deputy. Uh, is well aware, aware of the situation. And they're looking at different areas in terms of like providing opportunities for audits to get in a little bit late or, you know, those types of things to allow some catch up time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, it, it's a, it's a big issue. And I, and I don't believe that it's just in work either. I think right, a lot right. of times yeah. with these, all these federal programs, they've all uh, increased the workload significantly for mm -hmm. auditors. Mm -hmm. We're, we've probably seen, we probably, an audit nowadays is probably about 25% more information that they have to certify and process than they did just four or five years ago, wow. pre-COVID. Wow. Okay. Just everybody checking the boxes for all the monies. Lots. Yeah. 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 Lots yeah. of boxes to check, lots of grants, a lot of these new grants, SIA, uh, uh, ESSER, all of those ESSER grants, all that are uh, partial to single audit treatment, which is... You, know, you get your normal audit, then you get your single audit, then single, single. Audit. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's a significant. I'm, I'm glad they're doing it. Okay. okay. But in the meantime, as always, if you have any questions at all about our financial uh, situation or any questions about audits, please okay. let me know. I'd be happy to do that. And if you did want a presentation on, you know, kind of stuff that you want to look for uh, in this, please let me know and I'll put it on there. Of course. Okay. So real quick, yep. just because I'm new and I'm not understanding. Sure. In my thought process, an audit is like we did something and then, you know, like a, like a business. But this mm -hmm. is just normal operation for a school district, correct? Yes, every school so, district, most government, all, not all governmental entities are subject to audit every year. Okay. And our audit is done from an independent outside auditing firm. Yeah. Our auditing firms uh, have to have municipal audit licensure, uh, and so there's only a limited number of CPA firms in the state that uh, are, are licensed to provide such auditing services. Okay. Um, our audit fees are roughly thirty-five to thirty-eight thousand dollars annually. So it's it, it's a big deal. They put in a lot of time, uh, and a lot of hours on on these audits. So, okay. And it's just something we do every year, right around it. Yeah. <laughs> every year. Yeah, we, just put it in. we have audit season, budget season in my office. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Thatcher, I lost you, but I'll find you again. There you are. Hey, everyone. Director of Education. No official report, just a couple of uh, required information items as required by Oregon Department of Education. The first one is what you probably fondly know as the Oregon State Report Card, which is really the Oregon Attic Lance District Profile. So you should have got a copy of the district profile and then and one for each school. As Mr. Drill mentioned, this is really kind of a baseline for most schools after two or three years of not doing state assessments. Uh, so there's some data that's not even in there, but it does kind of give you a picture of where we are starting back up to a kind of normal school. And so there's the district, uh, if you're a, a parent or a human member looking uh, to move into the area, this does give you kind of a, a great overview of what's going on in the school. 
along the side, it talks about, on the, like, like you're looking at the um, district profile, that's where I'm starting. Uh, you can see the demographic information about our students and teachers and kind of our ELL population, SPED population, free reduced lunch, kind of get an idea of what our district looks like, uh, what our staff looks like in terms of teachers, how long they've been here, and then the numbers get broken down. But the big circles up in the top, just really give you a quick overview of, of what things look like in our district. Uh, attendance, um, third grade ELA, individual student reports. Again, that's not on there because of uh, for so many years of not doing testing. Some uh, math, which we know that's a low point for us. And then ninth grade, on ninth grade on track. This is not just the high school. This is both the high school and then the kind of opportunity center, the brick and mortar opportunity center, and then also the CBA online. Uh, there's a, there are specific measures for some of these things at individual school, but for the district profile, that's the ninth grade on track for the entire district, as well as the graduation rate for the entire district. Um, in each one of those, there's also some district or building level goals, which are written either by the district office in this case, or let's say it was Cascade High School written by the principal. So that's kind of an overview of what's out there. And then um, I certainly could entertain questions on those if you want to. Um, then there's certainly scores and measures for each individual elementary, middle and high school as well. Which, uh, which I think this data is out there. We've talked about some of this already leading up to it, graduation rate, freshman on tracks, and the test scores, but then um, ODE uh, basically compiles all that information and puts out something for the public around this time of year every year. So that's the first piece. Questions about the at a glance report card that Andy I could answer at the district level, or if people are here and want to answer at the school level, we can do that. I got a question. I think you can answer it. It's on the Cascade Opportunity Center. If you yeah. click on that one, why does it show we have 92 students and one teacher? Um, the only thing I could say with the one teacher is um, we had gone through some hiring and losing a teacher. And, and at, at, sometimes they measure like at a specific moment. Like the we day still, they took the shot, there was only we one teacher there. For, for a hire, yeah. which, which we were late. So I say, man, that's really efficient if we were down to 92 to one. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, we do work pretty hard out there. You are, <laughs> well, well done, but, buddy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, there are, uh, first of all, for the, actual, um, for the actual opportunity center itself, there's a certain couple of teachers, uh, and now you've heard counselor and, administrator and then also the CBA contracts with teachers on a part-time basis to help all those students as well so we'll take a look at why that that number just was skewed yeah, 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 grossly sure. compared to everybody yeah, else well. yeah. yeah you're right other questions about that all right so the only other one is again information that we've already gone over a couple of times but it's really a, a formal presentation to you on our SIA and we have to publicly uh, load this information onto our website, which Greg has already done and, and, and presented to you as well. One is just a narrative about how we spent the money, which we talked about both in different meetings as well as at the, at the initial when the budget was presented last year. We've used our SIA funds, which is significant, uh, almost $2 million to fund positions, uh, open a family resource center, family resource advocates, a second administrator at... Um, at Turner, account, an extra counselor at the um, junior high. So we, we um, the math coaches and then the IAs that will now do math interventions. We've, we've really uh, put a lot of our chips for uh, SIA funds into fund these positions that have already had tremendous impact on the district. We do some other things too, curriculum and math supports, and we do all of the AVA funding out of this SIA grant. That will go in summary on that district website. But then ODE asks to answer uh, five, four or five questions every year on what have, been, what have been the barriers, what have you learned, what would you do differently? And certainly those are in there, required questions. What changes have we seen the highlights? What barriers, like I mentioned, and a few other questions like that. Uh, what would you do differently? And um, what stands out? What would, you, what would you, based on what you learned, how would you use the funds in future years? which we've already set up a very similar, as you know, plan for this next year. We have not changed uh, hardly anything except for positions that we couldn't find. For example, uh, we didn't really find a director of equity that really kind of fit our, our, our culture, but we have contracted out or got additional trillion resources to help us deal with some of the equity issues. So um, this year we didn't get a um, campus monitor uh, 
but we are looking. And now that position is advertised. And so that campus monitor is also in the SIA budget picture. So really it's just a, um, maybe a, a formal presentation to you all on a, a recap of how we've used our resources in SA and how we plan on using them next year. So uh, we have to demonstrate that we've presented that to the board and also publicly put on the website. So those are the two things. Oh, so questions question. about any of that? Yep. So this is our second year of a three year. Yes. What happens after year three? We've yeah. spent all this money. We've got um, yeah. these people hired. Honestly, yeah. Honestly, I, I feel like the SIA funds, and by the way, uh, there's a ton of reporting that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. And mostly I do the narrative stuff. And I want to say, I want to thank Scott for doing all the number crunching. Because like he mentioned, all of a sudden, here's other big pots of millions of dollars that we have to keep track of. And, and he's done a fabulous job and making sure that gets done. But that's not going away. Um, yeah, as you recall, the, the, the state said, we're going to now tax corporations mm -hmm. to fund SIA and our high school success funds and things like that. So, um, you know, even if the economy changes a little bit and recession talk, those funds are already really there. I, I would say, at least for the next biennium, the next two years, the next three-year cycle, those SIA funds will be, will be available. There's nothing out there that, sh that would demonstrate that those things are at risk. Now, of course, you know, crazy things can happen, but for the most part, we'll continue to fund some of these incredible programs uh, the, with what we have. Now, what is, what is happening, I think I mentioned this last board meeting, was right now we're all having to do these reports about 10 times, right? We've got uh, the high school success funds having to do it, we have to do a school improvement plan and the SIA funds. And so I mentioned even in my board goals that, that, that uh, we're going to try to be able to do all this at once. But th the short answer is those funds should continue at least in the near next next two or three years for sure. So, okay. Yeah. And do you have a guess, Crystal Ball, how far out we'd know if those funds were going to dry up? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it would just be a guess, but but uh, I, 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 I suppose that maybe the elections would have gone drastically different. I mean, there still seems to be uh, across the legislature, uh, education is a priority in the state of Oregon. It's the biggest budget item in the state of Oregon. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, the, the, the corporate receipts that are coming in are, are going well. I would say you would have at least a year's notice if you thought things were going to change dramatically. Now, now that's, that's, that's uh, certainly something for us to keep our eye on because now we've funded some significant positions right. that support the district through that. So we would definitely have to be careful. Uh, or at least we'd have to adjust on how we're going to continue to fund those things. Frankly, when they become a permanent part of our budget, we're going to move some of them into the general fund anyway. Uh, Scott and Darren and I and others have talked like, okay, let's let's take the counselor at the junior high, for example. We funded it out of SA. Wow, this is really helping us. This is exactly what we need. And we continue to grow. Well, it makes sense at some point to put that into the general right. fund. And we could do some of those things in the near term anyway, but you're right. We would have to take a hard look at what we're what we're continuing mm -hmm. to fund. Maybe cut the director of education or something like that. If we had to. <laughs> yeah, it's a really disposable position. But um, you wish. Yeah, well, we already made it well, part time, so we're good. But 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 uh, so definitely something to keep an eye on. But that's not something, especially with the corporate taxes, that it would be it would be sudden. We would have some notice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Communication director's report, Mr. Costco, 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 Costco. I'm Greg Costello, so it's good to get a chance to be here. And I just want to do, you have my written report, so I just want to do two observations for somebody coming into the district with new eyes, and then one thing that came up since uh, I submitted the written report. Um, one is just staff here, and I just want to say how impressed I am with the dedication and the commitment of the staff here and how uh, the leadership in the buildings and the secretaries in the buildings really have stuff dialed in. And it's just really great coming in and seeing really good communication in place. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, and the second thing is just about the community support. Um, being, you know, at Cloverdale, when the new buildings were coming in and seeing that people from the community have volunteered to redo the entire feet. You know, just things like that happening all the time. And on a little basis, I post something on social media just about every day. And in this entire year, I've had one kind of negative comment. 
everything else is love what you're doing. This is so cool. And just that shows to me how much the community is supportive, which is really great coming in and getting to work in that kind of environment. Um, the one thing I want to add to my report that's come up just since I submitted it is that uh, we are, um, there is a Oregon lottery TV commercial that's going to be made that's going to highlight the way that lottery dollars are used for education across the state. And they are going to do some filming here in Cascade uh, this Wednesday. It happened really quickly. They came and did a site tour last Wednesday and then told me on Thursday that they wanted to come out here this Wednesday. So um, they're going to be, it's going to be kind of a blink if you miss it kind of a thing. Just little pieces of some exterior shots of Cloverdale and of the junior high and then some shots they're going to get on Wednesday of um, some teachers and stuff like that just to give a flavor for the wide variety of schools there are in Oregon. But I think that's really cool that we get a chance to do that and sort of put our school on the map in the wider states. So <laughs> And welcome for any questions since this is the first time I've been here. So you say social media. I am, as everyone knows, socially inept. Yes. Um, <laughs> so as far as technology goes, I kind of can communicate a little bit, I guess. That came out we, we, knew, we knew what you meant. We knew what you meant. Okay. 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 Um, so you talk about, we were discussing this up in Portland. Are we, do, do we, you post on Twitter? We don't have a district Twitter account. Okay, so what is the social media that you're on, that we're on? We are, at the district level, we are only on Facebook. And then a lot of the schools are on Facebook and on Instagram. And so what we find is Facebook is a place to go to get the parents and the community, and Instagram is a place to go to get the students, because that's where they are. So a lot of the Instagram accounts are, you know, the basketball team, the volleyball team has their own kind of thing as well. For that. Okay. Uh, and then sort of we have make sure that all our information also gets out to everybody else in other things. So mm -hmm. Parent Square will send out by email, we'll send out by text in all different ways so that you can see it. And then we have our website as well that, um, that often we're doing a link from social media to our website where people can go there themselves to see it so that people, everyone has access to information. Because that's where I go is the website because yeah. that's the only one that I knew how to get to. Yeah. Um, and Sometimes there's stuff there that's new and sometimes there isn't. So I'm thinking I don't know how to navigate it. Sure. So I need to figure that so out. The news one is the main one where the news tab is the main one where it comes. And the pic, we put a lot of what we do on social media is just kind of pictures of things that are going on. Okay. So those don't always end up on the website okay. as an individual thing. They'll show up in the little scrolling pictures or whatever that are right. coming through, things okay. like that. Um, just because it's not, you know, it's usually just a sentence that's going up on social media. It's not like a whole story. Okay, so I haven't lost it. I can yeah, do it. Okay, perfect. Okay. So are you the gatekeeper for everything that goes on Facebook and Instagram? Not exactly. So <laughs> one of the things, uh, I am I am the gatekeeper for the district level stuff that goes on on Facebook. Right. Right. And part of what I've been doing in the time that I've been here is just talking to different administrators and to folks of like, what's going on? Because there are... Uh, a lot of Instagram accounts that have just appeared over the years from different clubs or different things like that. And so what we've kind of unified on is um, I'm going to be working on a, a just like a one page social media do's and don'ts kind of thing to get that nailed down and get that out to all of our administrators and coaches so they can get those things uh, to the people who are running those accounts. Uh, also going to encourage with that that they're um, there's a, a filter system in place so that if students are posting, they're clearing that with an adult advisor, an adult coach, or whatever beforehand to make sure that we have that. So then do you have direct communication with the people that have the access or the admin to those Instagram accounts? I mean, is, is somebody accountable to you that's posting on those? Do we have people running out there just posting as at their own? There is a chance, yes. <laughs> There is a possibility on, on our, if you will, on the district's behalf. Well, it would be something like Cascade Volleyball Team or something. Which like isn't that. necessarily a Cascade sanctioned page. Right, right. So but they have our logo on. Yeah, nothing that's officially our thing uh, is. Because what I'm thinking is, is, are these things we're going to have to do damage control on if somebody ever crosses the line and does something that's not appropriate or acceptable? Uh, yes, always. That's always the potential. So that's part of the reason of being proactive and making right. sure we get that stuff out there to folks. Of, here's what we want you to watch out for. Right. Most of the um, 
let me say it this way, all the ones that I am aware of do have an adult contact and do have people in place that are watching that. The reason I can't definitively answer your question is I'm still learning and I don't know all the different accounts that are out right, there. Right, right, sure. Yeah, and if, like you said, if a student makes an account on their behalf for the, the basketball team and promotes it that way, but you have no control over it, you can't necessarily dictate what they're saying, but it still could impact us. Yeah, and, and you know, that's the reason <coughs> live in, the teacher having their own private social media one, that can have impacts on the district. You bet. And so, you know, you can't control everything. You can just try no. to be ready to, exactly. here's, here's good practice and get that word exactly. out. Exactly. Yep, yep. All right, fair enough. Good. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Much. Appreciate Thank what you. you're doing. Good job. Okay. High school principals report. Mr. Rasmussen. Good evening, you guys. I'll try to be brief. Um, good segue with the social media today. Mr. Drill and I signed a contract to have a guest speaker come speak to our students and community about the uh, dangers of digital social media safety. Um, comes in, he's, he's an expert in the field. He's gonna, it's, it's a bit of an entertainment, he's just some magic, but also a strong message. The reason we chose him is there's a curriculum in these mind um, that we can look at and help use and talk to kids about how to post well, how to do this. Um, and the answer to your other question is we do have some shoring up to do in terms of making sure um, we're aware of what's going on out there. For instance, there, our, our mascot is Kugi. He has an Instagram account. So <laughs> who's watching that? I have no idea. But yeah. Kugi's got an account. Uh, so we need to Does Kugi know the rules for posting? Kugi may not know the rules. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's exactly true. Yeah. So okay. anyway, we'll work on that. Yeah. Um, so we're excited, to, we're excited to bring it in. December 7th, um, high school is going to get uh, two uh, small group sessions with him. And then in the evening, we're going to host a community event for parents and coaches to come in and talk about that. Um, this is just off the um, coattails of the FRC and Liberty House having a uh, social media um, informational session for parents in our community. Over 60 families um, logged into that uh, webinar just a couple weeks ago. So um, it's an issue. We know it. We want to make sure that uh, families and kids are prepared to deal with it. So it's not going away. See, so coming into the school, it's not going to be. This guy's coming to the school. Yep. Perfect. He'll be here with us in the afternoon, evening, evening um, event activity, and then the junior high uh, Thursday morning. Great. Uh, so we've got five different, he's doing five different uh, assemblies, so to speak. Okay. So we're going to move out about that. Um, just in my report briefly, just to let you know, um, I want to highlight the college fair that Tony Willis put together. 18 different colleges, community colleges, um, <clears throat> tech schools, and military branches were there. That's a ridiculous amount. That's like going to some regional event. Right. So we had it right here in our own gym. And so hats off to Tony. Our juniors and seniors got to see a ton of different opportunities for life. And I heard a lot of good feedback from those kids. So it's very cool. And then one last little story, and I'll move on um, for you. Um, in September, Hurricane Fiona hit, um, started in the Caribbean and hit uh, Puerto Rico and then the Dominican Republic, moved up the coast and eventually slammed into Canada, Nova Scotia. But um, our Spanish teachers were teaching at that time and they thought, we want to help. And so they started a fundraiser, started selling candy, doing other things. And um, they set a goal for how much money they wanted to raise. And they were going to send the money to Red Cross for Puerto Rico. Obviously, Puerto Rico is part of the States, Spanish speaking. And so today I wrote a check for $2,700. Our students donated that money. Our teachers could have talked to Jackie Everett and Von the Bachman. So they did a great job just yeah. being great citizens in our country and the world. Great. So, Excellent. Anyway, awesome. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Keep it up. Junior high principals report. <coughs> Mrs. Lede. <coughs> One quick change to my board report. Um, we, I had put in there, we were going to do our senior Thanksgiving luncheon, but we have bumped it to Valentine's Day. Um, with having a new person in charge of leadership, you didn't realize we need to get the food order in sooner. And um, so we're going to be bumping everything. But we thought Valentine's Day with grandmas and grandpas is a great opportunity too. So we're looking forward to that, but just a slight tweak. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to really do is put a couple shout outs. Um, we now have Greg Nolan as our um, VP and I think Greg and Molly are a dynamic duo of 
Height advantage is a huge asset. I think they're both quite tall, over six <laughs> feet, and I am definitely not there. So I I need the step ladder. So that that's great. And he has been an awesome asset to our team. It definitely feels like a great team. Um, we actually call ourselves Darren's Angels, kind of take off of Charlie's Angels. So really, yes, oh, it's yeah, our nice. screen tag name. <laughs> yes, so we're quite proud of that. Um, <laughs> Molly did a great, um, she organized our Veterans Day Assembly a couple days ago, or last week, and we had 14 different veterans come through our door, and that's the most that we've ever had. We had multiple who participated in Vietnam, and the kids, a lot of them were connected by being grandmas, grandpas, or, you know, aunts or uncles, but it was a super turnout. They actually came and ate lunch with a lot of our kiddos, and it was just neat, a positive in both aspects, and a huge shout out even just to our junior high kids, you know, junior high aren't always amazing and they could not have been more appropriate they sat there and listened and participated and high five them at the end and so it was just a super heartwarming um event for all of us so that was great and a lot of them can't wait to come back next year so that was something that we definitely want and then the last thing um major shout out to my leadership class um brian slagle is in charge of this and um the first two years he kind of took it on, it was pandemic related. So not a lot was happening via, you know, um, our assemblies were online and everything. And now he is going full, full <coughs> work. And in the last two and a half months, he's done four assemblies. He's done a Halloween party. We've had two spirit weeks. Right now he's getting ready to host our um, annual eighth grade volleyball versus staff volleyball game it's coming this friday so if you want something to do come on out and then we're <coughs> and getting ready to have our annual um, christmas food drive so they are doing an amazing job and being positive leaders and that's what we need is you know kids doing a great job and he's chosen well for he represents our school any questions i have a question debbie um I know we still have a couple weeks to go in this trimester, but what are the recovery numbers looking from from trimester from the A part of the trimester going into the second um, trimester? I but pulled in every single eighth grader who has is failing at this point right now. We have about 50 some, which is down from where we normally are at. And I'm pretty sure that we'll have about 20 of those kiddos come off. A lot of them are hovering in the 50 percentiles and come on, you can do this. So, um, but then the reality hits of, oh, I've got 11 days. So right. <laughs> it's that hurry up and, you know, the typical eighth grade roller coaster panic. So right. most of them pull it out amazingly and then we'll start it all over a second Right. So it's lower than pre-pandemic. Yes, it I believe like. so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good group of kids. They're question. struggling, but you know they're getting right. They're getting that. Okay. So I'll ask a follow-up on that. On your school highlights, ABC re reward. The last sentence there says, "Additionally, we offer after-school tutoring every Monday through Thursday." Do you find that the kids that need the tutoring are are they taking advantage of that? Most of them it's, are, it, yeah. it's not a struggle or a stigma to say, "Hey, I no. need to get help." No, and um, this time of the term, the numbers start going up. They start seeing their grades. And, um, but what thing that we have done, um, <laughs> the counselors and I, each group has taken a um, grade level. And every Thursday, we email out to families that, hey, your kiddo is failing one or more classes. And um, we've noticed the number of kids that are failing is decreasing. You so. said that there's currently 50 that are mm -hmm. failing in the eighth grade alone. Mm -hmm. And how many students are in the eighth grade total? Um, 220 some right now. Well, that's a lot of kids, but what is that? 18, 20%? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. But considering normally we're running about 70 kids at this point, I'll take it. You know, we're getting Whoa. there. So call, yeah, we're call, getting... call her in a week. Well, I bet you the number yeah. gets down. Yeah. Right. Uh, really? I have 24, 25 that I think it's we're like in 58 percentile and only in one class. So I think of those kiddos will jump off. So okay. and we've had a lot of illnesses the last two, three weeks. It seems like everybody is, you know, passing around the bugs and sharing such. Okay. And kids not just out a day, but four or five days. So. Right. Okay. So we're, we'll be hopeful. We're okay. working on it. Okay. Good. Okay. And Thank we you. have a big incentive for the end of the term. First time in a long time that our seventh and eighth graders, um, Oregon State opened up a basketball game for us to get to I go. Right. And it's on the very last day of the term. So it, it's a huge win-win there. You have to do math and everything. So it's school related and, you know. Somebody gets to go and shoot free throws and um, kids who are passing all their classes and seventh and eighth graders get to go. The other ones, they can stay and do study hall and maybe get that grade up so they don't have recovery. So, right. And you find that those types of things incentivize the kids that are at the bottom when they have to sit home and watch their friends all leave. That incentivizes them to 
step up. Uh, that's what, when I taught sixth grade, I think the first time it was always, oh, they really are leaving me. <laughs> you know? Right. I don't almost think the kids would be angry and spiteful that they had to stay behind, um, but you're saying it incentivizes them. Um, the first round, it's rough. The second round, the numbers decrease a lot because, oh, I do have to stay here and do study. Hall, right. You know, and they always play it off. Oh, it was a lot of fun. You know, it wasn't. Right. Yeah, no, I started doing study hall for six hours. I started. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. 5.1 athletic director's report. Mr. Rice. Good evening. Uh, first of all, in uh, my report, I gave a little introduction. Uh, this is obviously the first time I've got to meet each of you. So thank you uh, for allowing me to come and chat. Um, I won't go through all of the um, pieces of my report that I put in there, but a couple uh, highlights just to point out was um, our uh, academic all state uh, teams. Uh, they, they were a, a part there. So our football team, our volleyball team, boys and girls cross country, all finished in the top 10 in the state uh, for team G GPAs. You will also see um, our participation numbers are up slightly, but holding about where they have been in the past. Um, in terms of wrapping up the fall, I think a big piece uh, to point out is that uh, our boys cross country team qualified for the state meet for the first time since 2015. Um, so they got to compete in that down at uh, Lane Community College down in Eugene. So um, we did wrap up the fall season. Uh, today does actually uh, mark the start of winter sports. So um, our basketball team got going today. Wrestling got going today. Swim got going today. So um, things are things are just trucking along. A um, couple things to point out with winter sports. We do have two new head coaches. Um, Nick Randall is our new uh, girls basketball coach and Justin Amaya is our new boys coach. Um, so those folks are new to the programs there. Um, and then the last piece that I think uh, just wanted to point out um, those items on the horizon. Um, I won't go through each of them, uh, but if you guys have any questions about those, we'd love to uh, respond, respond to those. I have a question. Where are the kids swimming this year? Still at State. state they are at yeah. Staten again? Okay. Yeah. So we are still um, trying to share time as, be as best we can. Uh -huh. uh, have been in touch with uh, our coach and the folks over at the pool. We feel like we're in a better spot in terms of sharing the space this year than we have in the past. So that's, so that's a plus. Good. Okay. All right. And uh, I mean, the items on the horizon are pretty, pretty broad. You want to yeah, are talking... um, so uh, the first one there, uh, we are going to move into a, a contract with um, Nike. Um, what that will allow us to do, they, they will actually give us $15,000 per year um, of, free, of free goods. Um, that okay. is their catalog price, so it is high, high price, but that $15,000 will be basically split up through multiple teams, and that will be kind of cycled through the sports throughout the course of like a four, a four year plan, a four year plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, what that will do is that'll allow those teams that typically might spend three to $4,000 a year on uniforms to spend that money else elsewhere. And then that will also, the contract also allows us um, for anything else that we purchase um, is a 40% dis discount as well. Okay. Um, and so the one, the one thing they ask is over the course of the first four years of that contract, all of our varsity teams that are in competition um, are in Nike brand right here. That was my next question is what's the, what's the trade-off? What do, what are we given in exchange for that? Yeah. So, uh, so this is, this is a contract that I would say, if you look at schools that are 4A, 5A, 6A, I would say probably 60 to 70% are in a deal either with Nike, Adidas, Under Armour. And so the trade-off would be the gear that we compete in. So your top and your bottom, whether that's a, a shirt and shorts, um, that has to be a Nike brand. The stuff that the kids buy, shoes or any other gear, they can be whatever they want. So any funds that our school spends would have to be Nike. Right. So when we're buying uniforms, we can spend their money and then any additional money is ours to go that has to be from Nike. Yep. So they're more than going to make up what they're 100%. donating to us 100%. in requiring us to buy it from them. And I would, so a caveat there is um, let's say our basketball team makes it to state and they want to do state, state shirts. Well, state starts in a week. Nike's not going to be able to turn shirts in a week. So they'll let us go buy. Sure. Sure. But the uniforms yeah. on the court. Yes. And again, if we need 
if they're if their money's paid for six of them and we need to buy 20 more, we got to buy them from Nike. Yep. 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 So there is a bit of a, tra- a trade off there. I think one of the things as you go down to, I think, 0.4 or five there, um, I think one of the things that I've kind of come to see in the athletic department is most of our programs are on an island in some cases, one of those being apparel. So you might have our basketball team that is wearing Adidas gear, and then our volleyball team is wearing Nike and our football team. Not that that's a big deal, but I think as far as a department and becoming a unified group, Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, is it a part of the look? It's a part of the brand. Right. Um, and so I think I think that there's some growth growth there. And then hopefully, um, you know, it's it's going to cut cut costs as well. So what do we spend right now? Do you have a guess on apparel? <sighs> on uniform apparel? Right. Um, I would say probably over fifteen thousand dollars is what is what my guess would be. Um, so and that's that, by shopping wherever we yes, want at yes. any price with whatever's got the cheapest deal in town. Yes. And yep. so. We're getting their free 15,000 and anything above and beyond. And so chances are we're going to spend less than another 15 grand Correct. of our money. So it, it may cut our cost in half. Yeah, but I'd probably say more in that 30 to 40% range. But we're still going to buy it at a more inflated price because we're not out being able to bottom shop it. But it's still cheaper overall than what we were spending before we got into this contract. Yes. And uniformity across the, right. the district. Sure. Yeah. The look, the whole, yes. the, the, the yeah. Yeah. Everything, the pride that comes with yeah. it. Yeah. And another piece with that, um, whether you're talking our folks that are in the finance side of things, whether it's our secretaries that are trying to process our purchase orders and those things. Now we're dealing with one right. person sure. instead of anywhere. Yeah. 27. How long are we signed on to this deal for? So it's a, it's a five-year contract. So we're in it for five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's 15 grand per year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When does it start? Starts now. So baseball oh. will actually, so we, uh, so we signed, I'm going to say in a, you know, middle of October. Okay. So baseball, so there was actually a uniform cycle already in place that um, basically the athletic department funds picked two or three sports a year to kind of buy. So right. baseball was in cycle anyways. So they'll, okay. so they'll be the first ones. To, okay. To okay. Do that. we have input in any designing of, we have one, one hundred percent. Okay, yep. so it can be our logos yes. and our everything. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sounds exciting. Yes. Yeah. Um, so a couple other things on on there. The our school today sports man- management platform is basically a software. Um, our athletics website right now is ran through a company called Beat BNN. They have a parent company that is called Our School of Today, which basically will run. Um, facility management software, transportation, scheduling, everything all under one. So some of that money that we are going to spend, uh, that we're going to save on the, on the uh, athletic uniform side, that's going to be about a $4,000 cost per, per year. Um, but we are going to start to roll that out in the spring. And then by next fall, that'll be for all of our district buildings. So uh, when a youth basketball team wants to rent the Cloverdale gym, is that a thing? Um, and instead of having Brian to be on the phone and talking to that youth coach, there's going to be a software platform that that coach can go in, can look at the space, request it through our um, secretary. She will not have to go in and check. It's already there. She can build through there. She, so there's a lot of things within that software that will kind of tie everybody together. And then it won't be phone calls and then asking somebody to make a call on that at the end. Okay. Um, so that's the R School Today software, um, the video board and shot clock. So um, last year, I believe the board approved and Mr. Grill approved um, the purchase of some um, some curriculum for our sports uh, broadcasting class that will tie into um, some video boards being installed in the main gym at here at the high school. Uh, that will happen in uh, during the winter break. Um, so at that same time, we will be looking into adding shot clocks uh, for basketball, which has uh, just been passed by the OSAA to be mandated for next year. Um, So that's a project that will be going uh, up in the middle of December. Um, And then some of the other things there, uh, Mr. Drill and I have have talked about um, kind of long-term facility projects that we need to kind of start to look at. We have not committed to anything yet, but a couple of those are, are looking at resurfacing the um, track that mm-hmm. is over at the um, middle school football field. 
Um, so that's a that's a project that I would hope to get going here in the next two to three years. Um, that's a project that I actually at my for, my former school that I just left, we actually completed. Um, so that's about a three hundred thousand dollar job uh, that I'll, that I'll be looking into that. And then um, there's an opportunity we've had recent meetings with some folks from Mountain View Seeds uh, to look at resurfacing some of our um, natural grass surfaces as well. Um, and then a couple of things that I was hoping to kind of just point out, um, <coughs> again, being new uh, to the district, I think that one of the focuses that I want to really look at, and I talked about this with the Nike piece a bit was, but looking at our department um, instead of individual programs and doing what we can to really come together and be an athletic department as one with teams or programs inside of that, as opposed to each program kind of being their own and on an island at times. Um, and then uh, I think as far as our programs, um, I think we can never do enough to talk about culture. And as we build culture, that's talking about the future. Um, I think sometimes we get caught up right now in how good our teams are, who won and lost, but are we really developing our culture that's gonna carry us you know, five, five to 10 years from now, so. Wow. All right. okay. That's awesome. You took on a big bite. <laughs> well, I appreciate being here. Appreciate the opportunity. Any other questions? I think we're good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Elementary Princess Report, Mr. Mincer. Hello and good evening. Hi. So uh, you all have my report in front of you. And last month we shared with you our elementary goals. So my report um, kind of addresses those and the steps we've already taken, some of the early steps, and then where we are with some data. So I'll go through that right now. Um, the early learning in pre-K, just hours ago, um, we finished our first ready for kindergarten session at the, I'm sorry, at the um, community center. And we had six families that came, transportation was provided, a meal was provided, childcare was provided. So the, the hope to that for that is to grow that, um, get more of our community members involved with that. Um, we also have a a kinder fest we're calling it that we're going to put on and it's going to be a regional thing so we're inviting um, elementary schools from up in the canyon and other elementary schools in eastern marion county to be a part of that um, and that is in in april and that's going to be housed at Onzo elementary too so we'll have more information for you for that as as that approaches um, the second thing i wanted to chat about was third grade reading data we we've seen some interesting data this year with our beginning of the year um, benchmarks and what we've noticed is something that's pretty atypical, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's really informed what our path forward is going to be. So um, typically we see a standard bell curve in our data. And that's, you know, that's usually, that's the system that we've built our interventions on is that, that typical bell curve. Right now, what we have is this inverted bell curve and there's really the haves and the have nots. So what we have to do is readdress the systems that we have and how we are going to best meet the needs of those students. I can tell you we've met already multiple times with our Title I team. Um, we've met with different grade levels to talk about how we're going to address that. Um, one thing that continues to be a challenge for us is to, to have a full staff of reading interventions. Um, and that's something that we continue to work on. I, I talk to Lisa probably once a week to try to schedule some interviews and get, get our staff full. So um, in the meantime, we're doing everything, everything we can to uh, design some targeted intervention for those kids so we can get them up to grade level. The last thing is fifth grade preparedness. Uh, Mrs. Cromwell was nice enough to represent our school on a ruler Zoom chat with lots of representatives from, from around our region, including some representatives from Yale, which um, ruler comes to us from Yale. So that was really cool. She was able to share some of the amazing things that our school is doing school-wide. The reason I put that in fifth grade preparedness is because our fifth grade team has really done an amazing job of spearheading some of those initiatives. Um, which is really cool because it's, it's really nice to walk through that fifth grade hallway and see kids working out conflicts on their own, not having to have that conversation in our office, not having to have these punitive, you're going to miss recess because you kicked Tommy or whatever it is, but they're able to sit down, talk about, hey, when you did this, it made me feel this way and that's why I reacted that way. It's really cool to watch. So that has been some amazing stuff our fifth grade team has been a part of. I know that was quick. You guys have been through a lot of reports. Um, one last thing I want to share before uh, before we open this up for questions is last week I had the opportunity to meet with Tom Lovell, 
a few of our maintenance guys and a representative from um, our playground company. We're, we're hoping to get that moving forward. Um, there's a few things we've got to iron out, but the process has been moving forward with that as well. Special thanks to Kelly, who's kind of um, put a lot of those things in motion as well. Where's so, that going to go again? Right. Well, kind of depends on a couple of things, but um, closer to the blacktop, away from the fence. Okay. I can send you a mock Like you've got the, you the um, between the two buildings, you've got the two si three-sided building. Right. And then you've got the playground this way. Mm -hmm. So from the three-sided building, is it going this yeah, way? It would replace a lot of the original structures that okay. have been there since I was a student there. Yeah, just yeah. a couple, like the yeah. swings and Most things like that. Most. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All Any right. Any other questions? Can you remind me what RULER, the acronym, stands for? RULER is our social-emotional. Recognize. Recognize, understand. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Learn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. where's that cheat sheet when we need it. Come on, that was a good answer. That was all right. Learn and encourage respect. There you go. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating. Oh, regulate. Yes. Thanks for the cheat sheet. I keep it right here, <laughs> so I have. It. Here, I am. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> oh probably. Other okay. questions? Yes, sir. The inverted bell curve and the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. I'm sure we would hear something similar from all the elementary principals. And a month ago, you sat right there and talked to us about how our elementary principals were going to align whenever possible. Is this an example of something where I will? I will hear about commonalities across and you working together yes. on that. Yes, sir. And I'm hopeful um, the week before winter break, we do our middle of the year benchmark. I'm hopeful to have some more data to, to share with you the growth that we've, we've already seen. But like I said, the, the biggest challenge for us is not having a full staff because that makes our intervention groups larger than they should be. And all the re research out there says the best intervention groups have three to four kids. And when we have inter intervention groups with eight kids, we're not doing everything we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Oh, actually, a couple things. First of all, I wanted to say it's great to hear something academically coming from the elementary schools. It's so great to hear all the great fun stuff that's going on, but it is nice to, to get down to some of this other stuff. And um, secondly, I wanted to find out when you said that you're um, in contact with Lisa about uh, reading special or people to come in and help with reading, is this uh, certified teachers that teach reading, or are you looking for a we're classified? Looking, yeah, we're looking for classified that? IAs. Um, okay. Right now, I have three um, reading positions open, two math interventions, interventionist position opens as, as well. This year, we've had three of our reading interns leave to go accept the different positions in other schools. Okay. Um, and I think we've offered in the last I don't know, two months, maybe five positions, and only two have accepted. So it's, I mean, it's a yeah, perfect it's storm of lots of things. So right. it's not for lack of trying. We're doing everything I can and I'll continue to do that. So if you know folks who want a great part-time job in a great community, let them know. So it's part-time? <laughs> Some of them. Okay. Like yep. what part-time, half-time? Well, we're, we're willing okay. to do anything. Okay. <laughs> you name it, okay. you name it. Bruce, you're working yourself loud. into a job. That's right. Nobody's always working it. So. Right. Well, I'm sure. I'll get you signed up. Yeah. Well, like how many hours do you like for? We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Chat about that. <laughs> I don't think so. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Okay. Director of Technology, Mr. Essex. There he is. Hello, everyone. I don't actually recall the last time I was up for a thing. It seems like it's been a while. Um, I just want to go over highlights of what we've been doing. I think it's been probably about six months since I've been up here, but um, maybe even longer than that. Just kind of give you a heads up or a summary of what's been going on over the last few years. Uh, we hear all this data, everything else. Where does the data come from? Devices, Chromebooks. Uh, that's one of the biggest things we've been, um, we've had to, We've been working on since 2018, 2019. I remember in 2018, we had probably about 300 Chromebooks district wide. Um, right now, we are at about 2,200, and that's not even including 
we still have some in the back we need to get out. We have a couple hundred in the back that we still are still uh, need to put out in the schools. So just increase in three or four years that that many more devices that we put out there. Uh, with all that, that increases the bandwidth usage. Uh, every day. and then every, we have students bringing in their own devices. All that adds up onto what we're actually need to get out and to have a fast user experience. Um, our wireless infrastructure here was antiquated to say, I mean, it was pretty bad, especially the elementary school. It was an ad hoc system, which means we'd go in there and we set up a, uh, an access point individually. And we do that for each one. And there's gonna be some errors when, we, when we're doing that. We don't have a managed system. And so on the main campus, we got a controller. We were able to have access points that we can just make a, we can make one change and it'll do it to, to all of them. So we had a pretty good foundation here on, here on, on the main campus. What we lacked was the elementary schools because we didn't see a lot of, we didn't have a lot of devices out in the elementary schools. We, not, not a lot of students bringing their own devices. So there are a lot fewer devices out there. So at the beginning of this year, Turner actually took the brunt of it. And we just saw a, a saturated network. And so the first week of school or so, our goal, or what we had to do, is just replace all the access points, and it was just a, a demolition. We went in there, pulled out everything, replaced it with new equipment, new controllers. We had to redo some of the network the, the called VLANing to get everything configured properly, because we just an increase in in in, in network traffic we saw, which is, I was not expecting that that big of an increase. So that was a big expense and a big a big amount of our time, especially during summertime and the first couple of weeks of school. Um, having said that, we now have a robust system of elementary schools. Um, I'm confident now that we can add we can add hundreds, thousands of devices more, and we're going to be future proof. So that's a relief thing from my department. That's to see that out there and I have that. That's that's really nice. It's, it's a big relief off of my off of my back. Um, another thing we're, we had is our, um, sorry, Chromebooks. We need a place to put the Chromebooks. And so each, a lot of the classrooms, we had carts, but all those carts cost money. So, so what we did, we found some other districts that were moving, they were moving away from the cart system, going more to a one-to-one. -one. So they were giving their carts, donating their carts to other districts. So we were able to get about 35 cards, and these cards were five, six, seven hundred dollars a piece, so it, it adds up. But we were able to get a bunch of cards from Woodward School District and a few districts around the Portland area. Bring them here. We still have some in the warehouse that we're we're going to be using. We're using to to put out now. Um, so that was a big relief too, just to, with the amount of money we saved. Some of these cards we got were brand new; they were still in the saran wrap and everything. So we got to unlock them and and put them out for the first time. So we're we're still deploying those. But a lot of the carts you see in the classrooms, those are all donated um, from the various schools. And so that's just, a, that's a big money, money saver right there. So we have Chromebooks we're pushing out. Another big thing is when I started here in, 2000, in 2006, 2007, we were installing Promethean boards in all the classrooms. So the Promethean board projector set up and it was awesome interactive displays. They were awesome, they still are. So we still have some from when they were installed in the classroom. And they were still working, there's nothing wrong with them, but you have to upgrade the projectors, replace the filters um, every three or four years, replace the projector itself. And they are just dying. A lot of the boards were into life. I mean, they were officially into life 10 years ago, but you know, we're gonna push it out as long as we can. So the, the goal, the plan is to get every classroom, my goal is to have every classroom that interact with the display. Um, but that's not obviously not possible because that's, that would be about 140 boards and they're three to $5,000 a piece. Um, so that's not possible. So what we've been doing is buying chunks, 20 here, 30 here. And we just, we have another 10 or so in, in our um, storage area. So what we're doing is we're just replacing the projectors that, the screens, the projectors that are just so old that they're pretty much useless in the classroom. We have some of those. So. If you have, we had some projector that you could barely see the screen. Elementary schools, you go in there, <coughs> turn off all the lights, and then squint, and you could you could you could actually see it. So we had a lot of those. Those are our priorities. Get those upgraded. 
you, you, I know you've seen them, the interactive displays we've had. Those are things that are awesome. We have some that are affordable. Majority of want them mounted to the rooms and that just free, that's um, saves space in the classroom. So we did, initially we had purchased about half and half on rolling carts, um, but we were finding out that the majority of staff want them mounted to the walls. And so we're, all the new ones we buy are we're having the wall mounted ones. And so all the new modulars that you were putting in, you'll see, you go in there, you'll see uh, the interactive display on the wall. Um, and the, the good thing about those, is we don't have to install electricity for the projectors and they have a five to 10 year shelf life, if not longer. And we're gonna, they're gonna be in there for, for quite some time. Um, I can give you some numbers if you want. Almsville, I think has 15 panels. They still need 23 panels to get to get up to date. Um, Turner has 12 of these panels, eight projectors. So it's a work in progress. Um, Cloverdale, Cloverdale has pretty good. Cloverdale has 11 panels, and I think they only need two more um, to have every classroom uh, with an interactive panel. And when I say every classroom, I don't mean every, I like to get every physical classroom with an interactive panel, but I mean a, a functioning classroom uh, with a, a class of you know, students and a, and a teacher. We have some classes that are, are used for counseling or other things like that. That's not a priority, though I would like to go into a classroom and have them all uniform. I would, that's not a priority. Our priority is to get a, a functioning classroom with you know, regular students coming in and out in the interactive display. So that's what we've been working on. Um, Albert's been, Albert and, um, I don't know, I even talked about our new hire, Chris. Uh, well, we hired Chris Bladorn about, about a year now. So I don't know if I was able to talk to him with you guys before, but having him has opened up so many, so, so much more time for us. Albert's stepped up and really did a lot of the more than networking things that enabled me to go out and do a lot of the server side of things and just have um, Chris out there pushing out the Chromebooks, interacting, you know, interacting with the, the teachers. It's been helping. It's been, I can't, I can't express how nice it is to have. He's our technically the fourth um, full-time position, but really a third, the third, because we have Carol, but she does all the, the data stuff, all the student information system and all of that. She's not the, the technician. So just having him and it's just opened up so much more time for us to do this, to, for us to do that like the first week of school with the access points and just have the time to do that. So I wanna thank you guys for allowing that to happen. That's, that's been wonderful. Um, so right now we're doing that. We're trying to get every classroom um, upgraded with interactive displays. Uh, I talked about the wireless. Everything is, everyone's bringing their own devices. Everybody, we have, everybody has a device, everything, you know, it all, adds up on the traffic. And so having that, having that covered at least for the next five, 10 years is, is a great uh, relief. And then one other thing is security cameras. Um, we have a lot of, we had 75 security uh, cameras on this main campus um, throughout the years, but a lot of those have died. Or, you know, camera died here and there, we don't always replace them. So we were down, we were getting down to about 40 on the main campus. So we contracted with a third party come in. They're going to, they've actually upgraded the cameras that the resolution you could have like one pixel. So they've actually upgraded those things. We can actually see and we're um, pushing out our storage so we can actually store the footage up to 45 days. I would like to go longer, but right now it's about two weeks and we I'm finding that's just not long enough. So I'd like to have, I'd like to see three or four months, but that's not practical, especially with the, the new quality of cameras that they use so much, you know, storage. But right now we're getting 40, about 45 days of recording time on the main campus. It's, it's still a work in progress. They're gonna be out here next week to get the actual server up and running, but the new cameras are installed. Um, so then it's, it feels good to get rid of a lot of the other ones. We had a lot of analog ones that went through the whole system and then we had to convert it up to digital. And that just, it was, it's nice to get that out of here. Um, at the elementary schools, we don't have it tied into our main system, but each elementary school has a DVR um, and they have up to 16 cameras, I think. Uh, I don't know the numbers right now, but, oh, here we go. Clover, I think Clover has six and we have four more planned for them. Um, Turner has 10 and then Omsil, I think they have 13 and they have a potential of about 16. 
So we still have room to grow in all those locations. As soon as we put a camera out, they want it, you know, we want it. So that's another, another angle because something happens over there. So I don't know if we're 16 is going to be the magic number, but if we reach that point, we can always upgrade it at another, another point and move up from there. Um, finally, in my ramblings, we are also upgrading our student information. Now, it feels like we've just did this. Um, I guess it's been eight or nine, I guess it's been seven or eight years since we've upgraded. But when I started here, we had a local system mm -hmm. uh, managed on all, in our, our server room called Schoolmaster. Um, they, they were no longer, had, their, their um, product was being retired. So we moved on to the same company, but it was called Tyler Sys, and they was an online host um, service. They are now being, they are leaving Oregon. We were only one of two districts in Oregon using them. Um, so they had pulled out of the market and it's, it's just not, I guess they're not making money off of us. Forever. So we have chosen a, a pretty pretty big company called Power Schools and they, they actually, a lot of the districts in our area across Oregon, Washington, they all use them. So I, they have great support. They tie into all our current system. That was a big thing with our Tyler Sears, our current system, that it didn't tie into a lot of the sports, the fiscal, all those other departments. So the communication was, was pretty bad. But moving to power schools, they have the manpower and they're big enough to know, you know, to tie into everything else. And so we can get all that, all those um, departments communicating. Um, the end, official end of life for our current system is summer 2024, but we are in the process now of upgrading everything, and we hope we all hope we will have it up and running uh, by the register by registration of next year. So registration 2023. If anything does happen, we still have Tyler as a backup for another year in case. And it's not going to happen, but just in case something does, um, we do have that. You know, at three years. So that would give us a good year of, in case we need to pull data or in case something else happens. Mm -hmm. so that's a, the big projects we've been working on. Um, any questions for me? Brett? <laughs> I always got questions. Sure, I'll let others go first. So. <laughs> you talked about, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no. New auditorium screens and equipment. What do we need in there? That's, <laughs> we went out for, we went out for that quote. It was last, I think I just looked up the quote. It was about last October when we actually got the quote out there. And it's just been, it was pushed back. What happened was equipment was not there. So he had ordered the equipment, special of projector for both places. Um, that got back ordered. It got back ordered again. It was first quarter 2002 and I got pushed back to the mid. Now it's looking at the first quarter of 2023. Oh, okay. um, that's what I was told before. He's looking right now at alternatives, but I, I have, you know, I, I'm not on the phone with him every day trying to see where he is. He's just telling me this is what it is. I'll let you know what it is. And okay. so right now we're looking at if it's officially the first quarter of 2023, but that means January or into March, April, probably. Okay would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, but that's, right now it's just waiting on projectors um, for both locations. <clears throat> and then changing light bulbs in there. How do you guys change the light bulbs in there? Do you have to go up from the top or? That's a, that's what would be maintenance. And they, I've been there where they've done it and they usually, we had a, we have actually a lift in there before. I don't know how they do it now, but we had had uh, scissor lifts in there. Right, but I mean, if you're look, if you're sitting in a seat and looking up and there's a light bulb burned out, there's no room for scissor lifts to get in there. I don't, I don't know. Remember Dan Allen? I remember being in there with Dan, Big Dan. Yeah. For maintenance, and he was in there. We were maneuvering the scissor lift oh in gosh. between chairs. I, I believe they actually had to remove some chairs at one point. Oh, get, maybe that. I bet they there, do. If I remember correctly. Okay. So I don't know how they're doing it now. If they bring a long pole or something. Oh, that's a heck of a pole. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Go so for it. What is the process <clears throat> uh, a school? Uh, needs new technology for curriculum that they've adopted or whatever, and they come to you and talk about what they'd like, and we all understand it's too expensive and we can't afford it and all that. When it comes to the planning and the budgeting for that stuff that comes two and three and five years from now, 
Is that you that figures out how much money we need for that? I don't figure out the money. I kind of figure out what we want to get. And I go to Scott, I go to Darren, I say, what can we, this is what we want to do. What can we do? And I give them the options of what we can do, whether it be, you know, another 20 Chromebooks or either option for something else. Um, they are very good at finding money. You know, we've, you know, with the ESSER funds and everything else, it hasn't really been an issue the last few years. Now it's probably going to be more and more as we, we lose those funds. Um, but recently it's been, and then we've had a lot of the other grants too. So that's helped out a lot too. If somebody comes, I need a laptop cart. Well, Tony has, you know, in her grant, she can do it. So we were able to do it that way. Um, yeah, but they come and say, we need this. Then we, I look at the alternatives. I go out some, some quotes, uh, see what we actually need to do. And then I say, hey, this might be right nowhere. Can we find this money? I appreciate your focus on the infrastructure for the future. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, discussion and communications. Mr. Drill. Uh, you have in front of you this evening an OSBA ballot for candidates. So you were just at the uh, OSBA state conference once again. And there are people, obviously, that were on stage that are regional uh, leaders. Right. And this is uh, the ballot for that regional leader, leader in our area. Uh, there was just one candidate that applied for the one position and the other one was open. Um, so there's that and also the resolution on legislative priorities that OSBA talked about. So uh, those are both in front of you there. I would rec recommend the person. Um, he is already in that position from North Marion and wants to continue. Perfect. Okay. Um, any questions about either one of those? Board policy updates, first reading. So there is a long list of board policy updates. I want to thank Jennifer and Lisa for working diligently on those, along with a number of administrators. Uh, they cover a number of different topics, most of which are required by law um, after the legislative session, the short session went in. This last year, the long session will come. Um, some have made changes due to court cases. Some have been changes now that Oregon administrative rules have been finalized. Um, very few of them are optional, but they are ones that we usually are updating because we had them um, in our, uh, our policies already, but they were five, 10, in a couple of cases, they were 25 years old. Um, so we updated those and uh, went through the process. You have this month and next month, we'll vote on it permanently to take a look. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to go over those um, individually with you. Okay. I would recommend all of these that are here. We did exclude a couple that were optional. Okay. Okay. Seven informational items. Student parent handbook. Is this you also? Yes. So Perfect. the informational handbook uh, item is that there's a student parent handbook finally updated and re-updated. I want to thank the administrators that helped. Um, this is one of those areas where uh, I would say there was too much spaghetti and not enough plate in the last year or so where things we needed to get done. We got done a lot of things. COVID uh, asked of our administrators and our staff many, many other things. Mm -hmm. We just used the previous year's handbook. It didn't change a lot, but after two years, we needed to make some upgrades and changes, particularly around any legal issues that might've come up. Um, these two ladies next to you have spent a lot of time putting all those pieces together and checking in with our administrators to make sure that each one of those are done. Next year, our hope is to have it even done sooner, um, but it goes into effect. It's not like we didn't have a handbook from uh, the beginning of the school year to now, we were using the old one. Now it's upgraded. We will try to upgrade again sooner. In normal times, we usually hand those pieces to the assistant principals who usually deal with lots of those things in June. And we ask that it gets wrapped up by uh, August so we can bring that to you sooner, more like September. So that's our goal. Do we still hand this out at registration? We don't hand it out. It's online. And we do have copies if somebody wants a copy of it. Okay. I got a couple questions about the actual handbook, Mr. Drill. Yeah. So page 18 in the book is about flag salutes and it says students will have a, an opportunity at least once a week during the school year to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. How the heck do we coordinate that? Usually through our principals and our secretaries. I mean, I'll start there. How do you guys do it? Every Monday morning, we start with the flag salute. Is that what it is? It's just a, it's, it's just by the day of the week, and that's the one day a week that they do it? Monday, the second period, we do the daily announcements, flag salute. Okay. Dyer, what do you guys do? Uh, do it every day. 
Um, and I'm, we have a Google meeting and it goes through, say the pledge, who's the first slides today. Okay. Same we have a Google, Google meeting. And, and what is, what's a Google meeting? I, sorry. In lieu of, I mean, for us, our PA system doesn't stretch across both buildings. So our announcements are on Google slides. Teachers go through that. So it's like on the, it's just on the, the. Exactly. Yes. And that, the okay. One of the first slides is Pledge Allegiance. They stand up every single morning. Okay. Pledge. Lisa? Every day. Every day? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who am I going to? Ah, Debbie? Every day. Okay. Ms. Thompson? Um, I'm Weekly. We probably should do it once a week. Okay. Okay. And then my other question was, we talked about searches. I think it's on, it's on page 41 of this pledge. And my question is, does that extend to vehicles? It can extend to vehicles uh, because um, when a vehicle comes on to Mr. Erasmus's campus, right, it becomes right, student, it becomes not necessarily the property, right. but you, it is a privilege to bring a right. uh, vehicle here. Right. Um, so what happens legally is you can go out and say to somebody, we need to search your vehicle. A student has the right to say no, but we then have the right to um, exclude that vehicle for some period of time or the rest of the year. Okay. Okay. But we can, bottom line is, we can't necessarily just say, hey, open it up. We have to ask them to, and they can not deny it. Um, it's a little like searching a locker. The locker itself is our property, but the bag inside the locker is their property. Ah, so, so if we say open the locker, they have to, but they don't have to open up anything they personal inside, inside of it. However, if there is and what is required by law is reasonable suspicion, not probable cause. Reasonable suspicion is less than probable cause. Because right. None of these people here are agents of police or they are not police officers themselves. Um, they need reasonable, reasonable suspicion, which is a lower standard than probable cause. Okay. Um, almost every time our administrators go through that process, they work with parents and, and, and things like that. But we have had... I have been here long enough to have had a parent say, I refuse to allow my student to be searched by you. Um, and then we went ahead and processed them for the three-day suspension for, I believe that that person had, it was a long time ago. I believe that person had alcohol in their bag. Um, so we went ahead and, and processed them. Um, and the school has a right to process somebody for up to 10 days to, to be excluded from school by law. Okay. okay. Any that's other it. questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. We have no public comment this evening, so we can move right into resolutions. I think we should still have to read it. Do I still have to read it? No. <laughs> Jeez. Do we have to read this whole thing? Yeah, I should. Do we have to read this whole thing? Okay. See, you get to read it. What? <laughs> Nine, 9A resolution. 9A the resolution regarding. 2022 OSBA elections and legislative priorities and principles, um, whereas the Cascade Board of um, Cascade School Board is a member of the OSBA and so on and so forth. A second. <laughs> Darn. It's moved, moved and seconded for um, Cascade School Board. Well, this isn't written how I can read it. Resolution regarding 2022 OSBA election and legislative priorities and principles. <laughs> Been moved and seconded to approve the candidate and the priorities and principles. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. 9B, resolution regarding board policies. Be it resolved, the Cascade Board of Education moves to approve the first reading of the board policy listed below as listed. Second. It's been moved and seconded for to move and approve, moved and seconded to approve the first reading of the board policies listed below. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, sorry. Future agenda items. Food service update, Mr. Drill. Yeah, so we talked about getting a food service update in January. Uh, Mr. Fasha, our food services director, did give me an update for this last month where um, more and more students at Turner and on this campus, junior high and senior high, are returning to eat food. So some of those deficits that we heard about have been cut in some cases in half, in some cases in a third. So more and more students are coming back to eat uh, breakfast and lunch. Still not back to where it was before when it was free. Um, this uh, staff that you're looking at for the most part has done an amazing job of 
taking a look at kids who might actually need that. Again, administrators can put a kid on free and reduced, but you can't put all of them on free and reduced. Just to, I asked Mr. Foster that question. He said that'd probably be bad. ODE <laughs> might flag us for that. They might audit that. that they might audit yeah. that. So we are uh, doing the best we can and identifying lots of different kids. Uh, the one thing that we are noticing is, is that um, the law also says that you cannot deny a student lunch and or breakfast, which sounds great. The problem is they're charging and they're charging at a rate that is almost double and triple in some cases what we have been uh, being charged in the past with before COVID. So we are going to have to deal with a deficit of how it is that we approach that. In the past, we have asked um, administrators to work with families to see if they can pay their debt. Um, we're working on that as well. Um, we have also um, asked administrators not to allow kids to be a part of something, for example, like a promotion at the elementary or middle school level or graduation, because uh, graduation is not required by law, but diploma is required by law. So we have asked to say you need to clear your debts and fees and fines before you can walk across the stage. So let me ask this. Do most of the kids who are accumulating debt, would they qualify for free and reduced? I don't, I'm not sure of that. Some are, some are, are not. I mean, I could put it that way based on, based on what we see. And, and of the, um, when, when an administrator can wave a magic wand and, and put a kid on the free and reduced list, then we go and tell that kid, Hey, you're now on the free and reduced list. There is a process by which they do that. I don't think they have to, they can talk to the kid. They have to talk to the family. They can call, but they, but, but they make that family aware that they are now is, on the free and reduced. That is my understanding. Yes. Is that correct? People, folks, anyone? Yes. They're, they're not in their heads. Yes. Okay. Maybe for me. Okay. The, the debt doesn't go away though. The debt is not. They have not hundred dollars in charges and we put them on the list. Right. The debt's still there. The debt's, you still carry the debt, but it stops. It stops the bleeding any further. Right. So we will bring that back up in January so you can continue to see it and decide if you want to do something about it. Uh, the other piece of feature items is normally uh, uh, Cascade School District Board for the last eight or 10 years, I believe, mm -hmm. does not do a December meeting. Uh, we have um, some stuff um, that are, is in need of taking care of, but we can wait on that till January, February. So if you're okay with that, we will move forward without a December meeting. We don't have any pressing issues at the moment. What do you think? Yeah, we're okay with that. Okay, okay. sounds yeah. good. I think we've gone long enough tonight to justify. It. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything further that we need to discuss or have on a future agenda that we know of at this time? No? All right. Then officially, we are going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much for coming <laughs> and participating tonight.